Stories of the Week is brought to you by Anapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at anapsis.com. And by Pony Express. Check out the Community Edition and turn your Nexus 7 into a lean, mean, pen-testing machine for all those hard-to-reach places. There's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at PonyExpress.com. And by Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at BlackHillsInfosec.com to request a quote today. Welcome back, everyone, to Paul Security Weekly. This is the Stories of the Week segment. Of course, here with Jack, Space Rug, and Joff to talk about none other than Keurig 2.0 K-Cup spoofing. That's right. This is a very... Did you see this one? I love this. I love this. I love this. this. I love this. I I brought this one up today, and somebody thought I was talking bra sizes, and it just derailed (laughs) Twitter for a while. How do you go from Keurig to... K-Cup. Oh, okay. Okay, Okay, K-Cup. Some people have bad minds. Just some people can't get their minds out of their gutter. A K-size cup would be a very large cup. The best thing about this is it takes me back to 1996. Story. Damn, I'll, get, I'll get into it, All right, but you, why don't we explain what it is first? Okay. Well, I was freshman in college. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm young and myself now. So he the Keurig, still in diapers. The, <laughs> the Keurig 2.0 coffee maker contains a vulnerability in which the authenticity of coffee pods, known as K cups, uses weak verification methods, which are subject to a spoofing attack. Through the reuse of a previously verified K-Cup. The way I understand it, it's a piece of the previously the lid, verified, the, the lid cup, that you take the, off the, the, the top the of the cut around, put it on your fake K-Cup, and your K-Cup is then validated and authenticated, and you're able to make coffee. So it's, it's classic replay attack? Is that what? It is somewhat similar to so a replay a attack because you're replaying a portion so, of the So my question is, how does the Keurig actually validate a valid K-Cup? Is it a photo recognition thing of the lid? Is there something in the lid that it's recognizing? There's got to be a sensor that senses Right, so uh, that's that my question. I, don't, I didn't – I mean, I read there's the a, – a, a, We're both going like this. There's a, <laughs> there's a, there's a sensor <laughs> in there that's sensing the, the K-Cup. <laughs> oh jeez! <laughs> I didn't want to go there. <laughs> That's all right. He'll go there, and if he doesn't, I will. Because uh, Larry's not. So here I heard it was a photo. Uh, it's it's photo recognition, basically. That there's a sensor in the top of the Keurig that basically takes a picture of the lid, and that's why this attack works. I don't know if that is actually the case or not. Oh, okay. So uh, in the attack, re- the attacker removes the genuine K cup from the Keurig and uses a knife or scissors to carefully remove the full foil lid from the K-cup, ensuring to keep the full edges intact. That's right. what made me think there's some kind of sensor around the, the edge. Yeah, right? I don't know what the sensor is. So it's yeah. interesting. I always thought that there was like an RFID or something in the top of the, the, the cup, and that's yeah. what it sensed. Oh, I got Like an ink cartridge has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah, evidently yeah. that's not the case. No. Okay. Keurig machines are bad. Did you know that? There's like health issues i don't drink there's off. bacteria that i drink whiskey builds well, up first of all you can't you, they're hard to clean thoroughly yeah. well you, and sometimes impossible to clean thoroughly bacteria and builds they're up. something about the foil to and you know the, the, the real foil. machines are better than they used to be but you know, to me every time i was desperate enough to hit one of those machines i uh i really appreciated the uh the fresh bouquet of plastic carcinogen yes. in my coffee yes uh, so 1996. Then 1996. We're going the way back machine. I was six. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, let's, let's earn an explicit tag right now <laughs> while I say to Chris, fuck you. <laughs> I just I was just six. Ch- children, wow. if you're listening, I apologize <laughs> for using bad words, but I've used them in the sentence. The si- sentence was, fuck you, Chris. Um, wow. <laughs> six. Did anyway, back in 1996. <laughs> I was 19. The loft was in full swing. <laughs> My beard was 17. And in oh, most wait, no. that's where all you old <laughs> Your beard happened. was 17. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> His beard, beard, beard was 17. Was seven almost <laughs> legal. <laughs> beard I, was, legal. I was older yeah. than his beard, at least. But the loft is oh where you, like, elderly hackers Us now. Elderly, got, now elderly now hackers. Now elderly hackers got We're learning here. our stuff. Yeah. And, and in most places that had coffee for work, most larger companies, 
Uh, they had a filter fresh coffee machine. Oh yeah, filter fresh. Filter baby. fresh. What is filter now, fresh? It, it was the brand of coffee that you would get in most large office companies. Oh, now, that's what it was like a direct drip. It right? was a direct drip. Yeah. And, it was and a machine. The, the filter fresh truck came around to your office, and it wasn't free though. Oh no! <laughs> right, this was before the days of free coffee and, and internet startups and dot com booms and all that other stuff. So you had to pay thirty five cents. To get your free, uh, to get your free coffee. Uh, oh, so it was like a it was a it was a vending machine. machine. It was okay. a coffee vending machine. Uh, it didn't have at least the ones I'm familiar with. Did not have the poker cup cups, which you guys don't know anything about, but us old timers know about the poker cup coffee cup. Anyway, we discovered a vulnerability in the filter fresh coffee machine that allowed you to get your coffee for ten cents instead of thirty five. <laughs> And we published a vulnerability on that. We published an advisory on so the filter fresh attack, coffee. So how did the attack work? Oh, I don't remember now. You can look it up. It's it's just search filter fresh loft. You'll find it. Uh, but anyway, when I saw this Keurig attack uh, on the uh, Keurig machine, and you had a nostalgic. I credit. had a nostalgic moment, and I was reminded of this filter fresh attack. And I've been meaning to all day. I haven't had time because I've been traveling all day. I've been meaning to go to the OSVDB and do a search on coffee, and, and find out what, what other coffee vulnerabilities are out there. Because I know there's got to be more than two. But anyway, that's my recollection of 1996 and today's top story of Keurig coffee bypass. It's fascinating. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Saved the quarter. <laughs> saved the whole. Back in 1996. Back in 19- that was some, that was some real quarter. money. <laughs> that was real money. <laughs> Damn it, a quarter. I was, you know, I was a kid back in a depression. A loaf of bread only cost a nickel, but you didn't have a nickel. So, you know, I see all these I see all these newfangled attacks and whatnot, and all I can say is, Loft did it. So, you know. <laughs> that was a whole quarter you could put towards your 9,600 baud modem. <laughs> That's right. 9,600? <laughs> 300. Yeah, 9,600, man. That, no, was, that 96, was speeding. 96, yeah, 96 you had a 96. 96, we were at uh, 96. I think we were yeah. pushing 14.4. 14.4, maybe, yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. by 97 was 14.4. Which, and it was USR Sportster Roadster modems. Oh, yeah, Sportster, those were awesome. Sportsters. That's what, we had, that's what Loft ran on for a long time was the Sportsters. Sportsters. Hey, they were the ants' pants, man. <laughs> the ants' pants. Sorry. <laughs> <Enough>. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, uh, so let's – I wanted to talk about – this article. This is the best defense. The best. Um, I, I hate to tear this apart, but I have space for throw it. In, in throw jacket. it on the table and, and perform an autopsy because this is fucking dead. I, I'm gonna throw. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm gonna drop this and then I'm just. I'm gonna leave. So the article says the best defense against a cyber attack is to know your adversary, and because Sun Tzu said. Oh Jesus! If you oh. know <laughs> the <laughs> enemy, stop right there. Stop. <laughs> stop. Where's stop. Jericho? <laughs> yeah, do we have a do we have a bat? The no, there's an, of a bat there's an image. There's an image. Look, there's look, an image in the, the article. Of a bat look, it's the whole thing. Look at summon down <laughs> Jericho because somebody. Uh, I'm not even gonna get into it. I'm not even I, gonna go there. I'm not going. There. <laughs> oh I, no! I want I, you to. Go, I'm, I'm not going. I'm throwing this out there so you go there. I'm saving my rant for the next one. That's. I'll give this one to Jack. I. I've. Uh, I've teed one up for Mr. <laughs> okay. Rogue. All right. But um so you got to know your enemy, Jack. That's the best defense. Right, cuz knowing your own shit doesn't matter. <laughs> cuz <'Cause> there's, <laughs> there's no <laughs> there's no point in knowing your own shit and then securing it cuz knowing your enemy, that's what freaking matters. An entire internet full the state Here's a news flash for you. There's you, and there's the entire rest of the internet. Guess what? The part that isn't you is your enemy, and parts of the part that are you are your enemy. Knowing you're in it, if you can't, but Jack, you but can't Jack, find you all your damned imp- printers. Shut up and go to find the. I, I will say, look, and look, I'm not saying this is easy. Cyber I'm not saying this is easy. About 40 hours ago, a Dell PowerConnect 3024 piece of shit switch, which is, I know, I understand that's a redundant statement. <laughs> Dell PowerConnect piece of shit. I understand this is a redundant <laughs> statement. I get it. It has had a static IP address for over a decade. <laughs> about, 40, 
You all right over there, kiddo? I'm, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> About 40 hours ago in my home lab, it forgot its IP address, and it's got a Dell quality DHCP server. Actually, it's Delta Networks because Dell doesn't make things. Um, and, <laughs> it just, and, and it literally is generating a million DHCP requests per 24-hour period. Um, and but that it was a cyber attack by North Korea in, putting in, in your switch. In my dude. home environment, it actually took me a few minutes to figure that one out. It took me because I had to like, what the hell is this? Because I have log analysis and things. And the can, logs are like, continue. what the hell is this? And I looked and, and then I was able to. Do you have continuous monitoring? At your <laughs> I have continuous <laughs> monitoring. Um, and I'll be candid, right? If I had to pay for the licenses that I generate every 30 days, I probably wouldn't have the network that I do. Well, for but you as an individual, not feasible, right? Right. Yeah. But because of what I do, I do actually have multiple active and passive sensors of different types feeding what I, you know, biased as I may be, think is a pretty cool system. Um, and I was able to like drill in and I was like, what the hell is this machine? What's it doing? That IP is out of the DHCP pool that hasn't been allocated recently because it's a, it's a Linux DHCP server. So it's not Windows. So it's actually a DHCP server that doesn't suck. Um, so it, uh, <laughs> what laugh, tell me I'm lying. Windows no, DHCP. You're not lying. <laughs> Here's a tip. Hey, if you're in Redmond, listen to this crazy idea. Hey, I've seen this box before. Let's give it the same fucking IP address we did last time. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> it hadn't been seen before, but thanks to it being a new device, a scan was run automatically. I knew what ports were open. I, I went to log in, and it told me who it was, and I went down to the basement and uttered obscenities and then and solved the problem. So I, I get Look, hey, stray device on the network. Hey, it's a static part of the network. It can't be a stray device. But still, I know that part of the network. I know that something weird happened there. I don't know if anything weird happened in North Korea. I can't tell. I don't know if anything weird happened in China. I know that all the systems in China are secure. Nobody would ever ask me to log into systems in China with default credentials before I had my fucking coffee in the morning. <laughs> So, I, I uh, anyway, uh, back to the point. The, the know your adversary. That's really awesome. That's that's brilliant. And as soon as you understand your own environment, its strengths and weaknesses, maybe you should think about classes of adversaries, but down to the best defense against cyber attack is well, know your adversary. Well, I think adversary. classes of uh, adversaries is interesting. I think you need to understand the attacks at a certain level. To implement defenses. Right. If you don't understand... Yeah. That's not knowing your adversary. Right. That's knowing the attacks, right? If, different. If you don't understand <clears throat> the difference between somebody who's trying to... S who's attacking you for fi direct financial gain mm -hmm. for credit cards or other things which can be cashed quickly versus someone who's attacking to steal intellectual property versus somebody whether they're lulzsec or other hacktivism <coughs> who's who just wants to watch the world burn, you've got a real problem. But the idea of really worrying about your adversary when most organizations don't know themselves. I'm going to take a slightly different tack, Jack. Good, because I'm completely off the I think it's here. important to know your adversary, but... There are so many other things that are more important to know that knowing your adversary is like way down at the bottom of the list. Well, the great thing about knowing your adversary is attribution is easy. I oh, yeah. Everybody, I saw that on it, the Internet. Yeah, because you can figure <laughs> out where attacks come from very easily all the time. They all come from China it or, Russia was, this, or North Korea. Right. That malware this week was North written Korea. with a Korean language set. Yeah. You now, you see, it's not it's not about knowing your adversary. It's about knowing the techniques your adversary is going to use. Many, many, many years ago, the uh, famous comic Pogo, at least famous for really old people, uh, had a comic which ran uh, the famous quote, I have seen the enemy and he is us. So if you want to know the adversary, know yourself and then worry about the others. 
Next. Oh, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, you, you have to know yourself first, and, and too many organizations uh, in, in our online and we're, world and we're don't not talking know about, themselves yet. We're not know, talking about knowing yourself. We're not talking about knowing in a biblical sense. That's a different podcast. You know, and that's, we've totally glossed over the fact that we're quoting Sun Tzu here. Like, yeah, unless I'm, you're I'm an ancient to, Chinese warrior general. And talking about kinetic battle, unless you're talking about kinetic battle without can, aerial drones and stone teenagers in the desert flying them. Um. Yeah, but it's still applicable because it's not, it's, it's a philosophical quote. It's not, it's not literal, know, know thine enemy. It's, it's, it's knowing the characteristics of the enemy, right? And, and that's what we do in this industry. We know the characteristics. We know, we know what these people are using. We know the techniques, right? Um, we don't know it all, but we certainly learn a lot about the enemy, um, and we know what characteristics are going to come at us. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't do be we? doing do, it. Do we? Right? Do we? In some do, cases, well, we do. Not all, I didn't say all of them. <clears throat> so yeah, because sometimes things turn out to be other than we, we thought. So uh, I've just started listening to the audiobook of Kim Zetter's uh, new book on Stuxnet. Mm-hmm. I'm on page 73. Uh, I... I've got to listen to that one. I, I'm. It's a good book for at least the first seventy-three pages. Anyway, I, I, several people have read it, and a lot of people who have been a little or a lot skeptical have have are deeper into it or have completed it and, and have said very good things. It's very well done. Um, I think it's a good balance of being approachable to people who aren't us, without making us scream at the book or the dashboard of our car if we're listening on a road trip. Um, But it turns out that she was scooped because cyber war started two years earlier. Um, We're going to segue into that. We're going to, we're going to strike before before we get to that. I want to know how they do the footnotes in the audio version. They do not. Okay. So I'm probably actually going to purchase the paper. Yeah, because there are a lot of footnotes and they're not just linked. Actually, um, Kim, I, I commented on Twitter about that, and Kim said, you're missing the footnotes. You were jump, jumped in on that. And I, I will grab it for the footnotes, but for road trips and, you know, for the, the drive over here and back, mm-hmm. uh, especially, you know, the next couple of weeks, because uh, Pat Gray had the nerve to, you know, take a month off every year and surf. So it's the end of the Risky Business podcast. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll listen to that, uh, clear that up. But, um Good book, but Cyber War. Uh, cyber War, yeah. Uh, cyber so there, there's where, an interesting... Going, I don't know. Here's the problem. Before I am completely dismissive of unnamed sources, and for tonight's show... I love unnamed sources. For tonight's show, I have changed my name to unnamed sources, so I have to make this disclaimer up front. You're four unnamed one sources. Of the, one of the challenges in this industry, one of the stresses of being in this industry is that it doesn't take very long before you learn stuff you can't tell people. It takes about a day. Yeah. And <laughs> all right, wait, so I should, you, it doesn't it take, it doesn't take very long at all before you learn stuff you shouldn't tell people. And then sometime later you realize the significance of that and you stop telling people stuff you shouldn't. Yeah. So I want to have some respect for unnamed sources. However, there yeah. is an article in Bloomberg, which I have linked to, which is Mysterious 08 Turkey Pipeline Blast Opened New Cyber War Era. And it comes down to four unnamed sources. And... Let me... Let me... Let me talk... If, it, if, if you're an unnamed source, let me just talk about that first. Let me put this in here. If you're an unnamed source and you can't or shouldn't talk about stuff, then shut the fuck up. Excuse my language. Thank you. Give me a beep there. Uh, <laughs> just shut up. You, you have no reason to say anything. You shouldn't say anything. You're not getting anything out of saying anything, so shut so, up. So Right, so do what some people do when they hear some of our stories, right? They're driving to work or they're on the train and they have their earbuds in or they're, they get this thing cranked and they're – Cursing obscenities where no one can hear them, 
because they know more of the story and that's where it stays in the car or in their brain um, because you have to shut you have to shut up. Now, let's talk about this particular article in particular. Mysterious 08 Turkey Pipeline Bash Blast opened new cyber war error. Published in Bloomberg this morning. Uh, basically has a lot of... I'm not going to debate whether or not this actually happened or was a... It actually did happen. There was a blast in Turkey of a pipeline. It blew up. What The debate is what the cause of this blast was. Was it a cyber war attack, which is what this article is alleging? But there isn't really any proof in this article. There's a lot of quotes from named sources that <laughs> background information that sort of filler, B-roll, if you will, that doesn't actually speak to facts in the, in the case, as it were. The only facts in the case that these reporters are referring to come from four, count them, one, two, three, four, unnamed sources. And you just have to sit and ask yourself, why are these people, these four people, going on the record to promote this act of cyber war, which has been secret now for years? Why now make it public? What's the what's the what's the motivation? You're not getting any press out of it because you're unnamed. So why are you talking to the press? What do you what's your hidden agenda? What are you pushing? So maybe there actually was a cyber war attack here. If on I this were pipeline. a cynical old bastard, I would say there was something about a cash grab from uh, no. cyber, 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 cyber. Victims. Now I haven't had time to do the research yet, but there's also another pipeline that's currently in negotiations here in the United States. Gee, imagine that. I'm not saying there's any connection. I don't know if there is or not. I haven't done the research yet. Uh, but it seems interesting that there is a pipeline up for debate in the U.S. Congress when the U.S. publication Bloomberg publishes an article about a cyber war attack on a pipeline in Turkey that's, what, 10 years old now, 8 years old? Um, at least at least there's no gaming. Like, I don't know, there certainly isn't any big pipeline project in the u.s yeah, that, that's what I'm oh saying. wait holy shit keystone my what yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> exactly so i don't again i don't know if there's any connection i don't know if this we're not saying it's a conspiracy theory but the bilderbergs it, but the bloomberg uh, yeah. article so if i may only, be master of the yes, obvious yes your point is there is an agenda we just don't know what it is and things don't happen by accident this this publication is there for a reason Somewhere down the road, we're going to find out what that reason is, perhaps. Maybe. Perhaps, but in the meantime, normal people, in other words, not you and I, who understand this sort of thing and are skeptical, normal people are reading this article and thinking, oh my God, cyber war is among us. What are we going to do about it? Pipelines are bad. Pipelines are bad, or the pipelines are targets. The, Let's pump yeah, money and, into and, this. And, and so and perhaps it. that is part of the agenda. It perhaps. is. It's possible. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of possibilities here. We don't know because the four sources are unnamed. Now, let me get back to unnamed sources, right? So you got four people who are all basically saying supposedly the wait, same wait, wait, thing. Wait, 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 wait. Before we get there, yes. we have one person who wrote an article. Actually, two people. Two people. Who wrote an article yes. who claimed that there are four people. Yes. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> Whatever. <coughs> They're journalists. They want to get their name out there. They have motivation to write this article. Wait, wait. Say journalist again, and I'll put the air okay. quotes around that, you. Okay, journalists. Maybe I should say reporter. Journal reporter, <laughs> right? Uh, reporter, journalist, two different things, <laughs> separate words. That's why there are two different words, journalist and reporter. They're not the same. Don't confuse them. So back to the unnamed sources. we got four people saying the same thing to this, these reporters who, like, where did they come up with the story, right? You got four. How come they're unnamed? If there are four people who are unnamed, there must have been more people involved because there's only one person who can keep a secret unless the other guy's dead, right? So there's four people who have this secret. Where are all the rest of them? And how come they aren't coming out of the woodwork? And how come they aren't talking to reporters with a name attached to them? My guess is that there was a story that was circulated around the water cooler that four people happened to overhear and they thought it was fact. So now they're talking to the reporter, and, and the reporter's thinking, oh, I have four different sources all confirming the same thing when they're actually the same source because it all comes back to the same point of reference. Case in point, 60 Minutes, Brazil blackout. Oh, my God. 
right? <laughs> they claim they had oh dozens, God. dozens of sources within the intelligence community that confirmed that the Brazil blackout was due to a cyber war attack. However, the Brazilian <sighs> government, the Energy Regulatory Jesus. Commission in Brazil, actually issued a multi-page report that said the blackout in Brazil was not cyber war. It was because there was soot on the insulators that caused the blackout. Now, when this oh, information... Oh, come on. Next you'll blame freaking squirrels. Uh, it, well, <laughs> <laughs> then did 60 Minutes, when presented with this information, re, re, you know, uh, retract their story on the Brazil blackout? Did they say, no, it wasn't cyber war? It was soot on the insulator? No, they didn't say that. They said, we're standing by our 12 or dozens of unnamed sources in the intelligence community. Because these we all know intelligence community people. These are the same people, people that nearly drove Audi out of business, right. crushed their business in the United States, and were proven to have reported on fraudulent, fraudulent uh, behavior by a, a charlatan, uh, air quotes, mechanic uh, because of the runaway acceleration thing. And it was because of this and that and that. And the reason you have to step on the brake before you can take your car out of park now is because 60 Minutes – Fucked Audi hard decades ago and will not admit that they did it. So, uh, wow, that's investigative journalism. And if the investigation leads to the truth and the truth isn't sexy, lie, bastards. Right. So, it, in the, so my point. This used to be saying, your podcast, by the way, Paul. If you have <laughs> dozens of, of information, <laughs> unnamed sources all saying the same thing, and they're in the intelligence Paul, community, Paul. it's not like the intelligence community doesn't talk to each other. It's not like they don't share stories around the water cooler and say, oh, I heard this great cyber war story. Let me tell you about this. And then they all repeat it to each other, right? And then they go talk to the reporters differently, separately. <laughs> and the reporter says, the reporters say, well, I have 12 different sources from 12 different places. I must have a valid story. <laughs> and Paul, of course, has now turned to Paul.com. Uh, excuse me, the Paul Security Weekly over to Space Rogue. This is now the Hacker News Network. So what other stories <laughs> do we have this week? Uh, <laughs> in a completely unrelated story, Belden buys Tripwire for $710 million, which keeps network burglars out of the Internet of Things. There was another big deal in the news this week as well. Uh, so Belden this is first your of all, show now. First, so of all, <laughs> first of all, thank you. I never you know, reported congr on mergers and Congratulations. To our friends at Tripwire, yes, Dwayne and Cindy particularly, but the rest of the crew, um, we we know folks there. That is great. Um, you know, Tripwire was acquired uh, by Toma Bravo at about the same time. NetWitness was acquired by RSA. Anastaro was acquired by Sophos. Uh, and Neohapsis was acquired by Cisco. But Neohapsis was acquired this week by Cisco, which is... An right. interesting move. That's a that's a brain trust move. It's, it's supposedly cloud, whatever. But it's a Cisco you know, that, isn't that one strikes me as being a a brain trust move as as much if not more than the the stated cloud move. Cisco's not done. They're going to make some more acquisitions in the space. Uh, they, this uh, isn't. There wasn't. This wasn't their first. It won't be their last. So, so it was about it. How long ago? Year, a bit over a year. I think for so. Source fire. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of us who, look, I've got Cisco gear upstairs and down in my network, and the Cisco gear did not lose its static IP and freak out like my crappy Dell switch did. But some of us like to throw rocks at Cisco sometimes, and sometimes they deserve it. They, they have had a cycle of, we're a security company. Security's hard. Screw that. We're a security company. Oh, shit, this is still hard. Screw that. But they, they seem to be at least making a more sustained effort this time. Uh, yeah, and I, I think that Cisco is probably looking at other people in the space right now, and I, I expect another acquisition within six months. I have no idea who, but that's just that's just oh, that's yes, my you theory. Do. No, I don't actually. Uh, yeah, <laughs> okay. I don't. Well, maybe yeah, I do. I, I, I do agree I? they're not done. <laughs> I do. Okay. Um, I, I, I would I, imagine I agree they're not you would done think that. And of they've somebody. had, you know, Jack, as you just pointed out, they've had. Um, a couple of different cycles of, of saying, yeah, we want to we want to go into these waters, and yet they weren't ready, and then went back in, and yet they weren't ready. But I, I, they're not done. They're right. not finished. They're, they're they, serious. They can't be done. And security makes more sense than their forays into consumer electronics. Um, you know, I, I'll I'll always carry a grudge for them destroying Pure, 
Uh, for those that remember the flip camera, the first really sweet little pocket video camera. You know, our, our smartphones have replaced them now, but the original flips were awesome. They bought Pure. It was going to be part of the Tele something or another. Tele Dildonics? No, that's different. Um, the, <laughs> the Tele video stuff, and then and then they just killed it because they let it die. Uh, Linksys, they really didn't know where to go with Linksys. Security makes sense, and it, it makes sense from a, uh, please forgive the buzzword-laden phrase, operationalization of security um, perspective of just baking this stuff into what we're running anyway. It, it makes sense for yeah. Cisco to go there. And, you, you know, there are other folks. I, I'm kind of waiting for Juniper to make a play in this area. They're, Juniper is kind of diversified into a couple of buckets, and they've, they've put some things in one bucket. Now, the next, the next big play I expect in the next couple of months is HP. HP. Yeah, H HP, well, HP is already. But they have, HP but they're going to buy somebody else. Are, HP they're is already, already there. HP is forked. Yep. And possibly a word that rhymes with forked. <laughs> um. oh, <laughs> really? Okay. Um, no, I think there's going to be a showdown. I think there's going to be a. Actually, I predict there will be a showdown between HP and Cisco uh, in the coming future uh, on the security front. Well, so uh, if you if you that's entirely possible, Joff. If you look at what we used to call Procurve and were to take a look at what we used to call network security, uh, there's there's certainly hopefully you're you're playing the drinking game and you're where you're gonna sleep tonight. Uh, there hope you know there are certainly synergies there. Um, what the Come on now. Clean up your language, Jack, will you? <laughs> I'm sorry. You, hey, All right, I must I apologize to our audience. There are fucking synergies there. <laughs> is that better? better? That's better. Okay. Thank now, you. Paul, you got to give him a break. He is trying to leverage his core competency to seek synergy. I mean, you know, All right, you seriously. use the, the, the leverage word. Listen, to everyone Pivot. who sells shit. Everyone. Everyone who sells shit, especially software. If I want to leverage a solution, I will stir my iced tea. Shut up. Sell me shit. Um, <laughs> I want to leverage a solution else through my ICT. That is gold. That is gold. Wow. The, uh, for, uh, by the way, I just have to editorialize you remember when this just was, for a moment. You remember, hey, hey, Joff, you remember when this was Paul's show? Who? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I do. Yeah. Uh, just, just to editorialize just for a minute, for, for a warm-up to show 400, it doesn't get better than this. So, folks, please come back and see us next week because we're on fire and we're just getting better. I will uh, be bringing several components to uh, expand uh, what we can do in the bar here. Paul has uh, provided a uh, substantial bar. Frank has added to it with a large bottle of uh, bullet rye. Paul and I and bullet rye have history. But next week, uh, Father Christmas will, of course, be uh, behind the bar. Uh, okay, Jack, circle back for a minute. I personally... I'm excited that some of the bigger players are, are looking to operationalize security because I think it gives us visibility um, more so than ever. Um, folks have made some mistakes as they've come along, but it's it's important that, um, to use a marketing term, that we get a little bit vertical uh, in the space uh, and that... Um, that that the, these these bigger companies that are that are traditionally pushing operational solutions um, get on board uh, with with the wider perspective because I think that the visibility aspect more than anything else um, I counts. I disagree. Uh, okay. I, I like to see security getting into the mainstream, being bought by the by the bigger players. That's great. But I I also like to see unfortunately what I see happening when that happens when the big guys buy the small guys is there's a brain drain, right? You lose knowledge. You lose, you lose uh, uh, expertise that was there, and it no longer becomes a core competency of the organization. It becomes, but don't they just fork anyway? Sometimes, and that's good. I like seeing small companies who can make it and become big security-wise. You don't it's, see that much. Every now and then there's a success story, and I'm not ready to call it a success story. I ha name However, one success story of a security company that's still that's not AV – that's big and only does security. Well, my opinion like was based to, purely on the visibility aspect. I, I like to, to point to 
imperfect though it may be, RSA and NetWitness. Because the acquired company is now running the acquirer. Okay. Our buddies at NetWitness are largely in charge of RSA. I'll give you that one. Um, and, and, you know, that may be the exception that proves the rule, but that one gives me hope. That gives me hope for, uh, you know, Marty and the team that he built at SourceFire that's at Cisco. They're not going to take over Cisco. But, you know, that may be a team. It's That's still too, too early to too tell. It's too early to tell, but that gives me hope, especially for the team at SourceFire. You know, they're... Yeah. And they've hung on to people. It wasn't one where people bailed immediately. You well, know, I, you know, I have to give Cisco a little bit of credit here. I think their acquisitions culture actually matured over time. I think they had a realization. And this is just me looking well, from the outside. If you squander billions, hopefully you wake up. Right? Well, well, right. Uh, but I think, they, I think they had a realization so that, that they even could the not. chambers realize they've wasted money. Exactly. I, and I think they could not, they realized that they could not uh, necessarily dominate some of these acquisitions and they needed them to run semi autonomously, which is, I think, really kind of important. Look, Paul has 20 more stories and I don't care about them. Um, hey, Paul, you can have your show back if you'd like. No, 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 you can't. No, you can't. Because my story number three, I, my story number three, I may have in the past questioned. The validity, the legitimacy, and the right to draw oxygen that comes from Ponemon reports. There is a post out now which one of those data nerds has so completely disassembled and taken apart. Ponemon has been Ponemoned. <laughs> And gold, <laughs> more gold. Uh, uh, Rich tonight. Ponemon has been ponemon, ponemoned, um, and this is the thing that kill that is just stunning about this is that this starts with accepting Ponemon's bullshit numbers. It starts with accepting selection bias and confirmation. It starts with accepting a non non scientific distribution of input. It's starts by saying, okay, I'll take your bullshit numbers. Let's just see if you analyze them right. And the answer was, not surprisingly, wow, you suck. Um, so my story number three. So if you're a data nerd, it's great. Uh, the critical thing here is that as I and, and many other people have said, the, the t key takeaway here is not only is he wrong, Ponemon is potentially damaging to security because he is so wrong. It's it's brilliant. It's over my head. It's like math and numbers and shit. And it's like logarithms and fucking lines that aren't straight and shit until you do unnatural acts with mathematics. <clears throat> but if you read through it and you like skip the big words, it still come down to the end. And it's like, holy shit, it's worse than I thought it was. Uh, because I tend to focus on how bullshit the input is. So even if you believe the input, the output is bullshit. Um, I personally don't have anything against Larry Ponemon and the people at the Ponemon Institute. I just think they have damaged the industry with bullshit through the years. I completely agree. And somebody else, and there are others who have agreed with me who can't because of where they are, um, you might have been on one of those emails, Mr. Rogue, but <laughs> it, it's, just, it's just uh, d a thorough dismembering of assuming that the numbers, which I don't believe are true, which they're not, what he does with them is, is wrong. Ponemon's nonsense is utterly Ponemon. Um, did wow. you want to Paul, did you want to interject here or something? I, this is your show. I, I have I we'd two, let you say something. two semi-related stories that have to do with the Internet of Things, which I still hate that term. But anyway, one is a very sensationalized story from the register about home Wi-Fi security is just as good as 90s PC security, which is very much sensationalized. They did a, a survey 
Of to two- register? Sensationalized? Who did they no survey? No shit. Home users? Really? Two, 2,000 UK households and oh, found yeah, that, that's that... That's a verify, you know, that's an authoritative source there. 23% of consumers use their hey. address name, you phone know, number, street name. You know, if Darren Pauly wrote it, it might... <laughs> <laughs> Paul's just like, I give up. <laughs> You know what? The, there not there are a couple of good folks <laughs> at the register. There are. Much, there still are. As much, man. You know, um, <laughs> the register's John not that is, bad. It, but it's fun because they like to have fun with what they do. So, Paul, you were saying. <laughs> what, 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 so what, what was the survey they did at the register with 2,000 household users who have <laughs> no sense of security whatsoever? Woo, woo, train wreck. <laughs> oh. So he said, today's route of security situation is very res- reminiscent of PCs in the 90s. I thought you guys would remember that. With lax attitudes towards security combined with new vulnerabilities being discovered every way, blah, blah, blah. The big difference is people have much more personal information stored in their devices today. So the, the 90s, 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 you were what, 90s, six, right? If you were wait, six, wait, wait. No, Chris the 90s, was six. Oh, Chris was six. Yeah. If, uh, if you were at the, in the 90s, you can't actually re- – if you were really in the 90s, you don't remember them. No, wait, that was Woodstock. That was the 70s. <laughs> Yeah, the you're a couple of decades out there, Jack. I, I, would, I would disagree <laughs> with that statement from the register that the 90s equals PC security of the – I mean, there, there's a lot, there's a way more d- – It's a bad parallel. It's a bad parallel. It's a bad – It is a bad, a bad parallel. Comparison because and you don't actually store information on a wireless Wi-Fi. router. No. Uh, information there, but, goes through but it, also, but you don't store but your wi- it on Also, it. Your in the 90s, how many things were globally interconnected? 24 hours a day, tw- you know, 365. Yeah, 30, with, None. With – with giant fat pipes, except unless, you know, like Comcast or Time I mean, you were only connected when you dialed up, right? Yep. And so people ignored desktops, PCs, because they were too freaking slow. You're at 300 baud. Mm-hmm. You're at 9,600 baud, right? Nobody cared. We went to hack into mainframes in the 90s. Right. So it wasn't until... Hack in the Gibson, baby. I mean, it wasn't until the late 90s, 99, 2000, 2001, when you started seeing mass attacks against desktop because they were always connected on fat pipes. Yep. The dial-up, who cared? Nobody wanted that. Right, right, right. I mean, you got it. You know, I mean, I think it was still in the '90s that Windsock.dll came to the Windows oh, PC, Jesus. right? So, <laughs> wow, that <laughs> takes me back, Joff. So there was another article uh, from Dark Reading on Dark Reading um, the holiday gifts that will keep CISSOs up at night. It's all about the Internet of Things. So apparently, employee wellness. Let me let me just say something. If you if if you're a, if you're a corporation and you're still worried about users bringing in their holiday gifts to connect to your network in in, in 2014 almost 2015 you need to like rethink your network. So <laughs> no wait you're way way out behind. of date. Yeah. You have no freaking clue what's going on. But now <laughs> one of the premises is that employee wellness programs now some 80 percent of organizations with more than a thousand employees to get the statistic correct are enabling their employees with fitness tracking devices as part of employee wellness programs. And these are of a grave security concern as a diligent hacker can monitor employees where they go throughout the day. So your Fitbit yes. is connecting to your corporate network. Your Fitbit is, is Bluetooth and somehow an attacker could hack that Bluetooth and track your employees. And that's what's keeping a CISSO up at night. As well as... I think if, if my CSISO was being kept up at night by Fitbits, I'd be wondering about the rest of the network. Hotspots and data centers, these are, of course, devices that you put in your data center that have 4G that talk back. This is also keeping CISSOs, CISOs up. Who puts a 4G hotspot in their data center? Well, that's what they're saying. An attacker is going to drop that uh, off in their, in oh, their data oh, center. Oh, they'll leave behind. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's a great... Close, close, close relation to the reach around. Concern. Leave behind. Yeah. I'll leave. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, oh, and oh. also Bluetooth in the boardroom. So if you have Bluetooth enabled devices, attackers can. Who the fuck's using Bluetooth? That's what I want. I turn that shit off. Uh, you do, but to people in the boardroom. People trust it, man. People trust it. You'd, you'd be surprised. People I, trust it like it was a wire. I don't know. I, I think that your network should be strong enough and robust enough to handle these. But it's not on the network. So there's a device in the boardroom that's a VoIP phone. It's a. You know, what, you, know what this is? you know what this is? It's the old dual homing problem of the 90s. Yes, it's exactly yes, what it is. is. I think this one has less. Oh, one has dear legs. God, dual home. The next he's going to say bastion host. What the <laughs> fuck? Oh, God. I mean, back, three times back in the day. Drink. Back in the right? day, I had a bastion had, host in my DMZ. You, yeah. had, you had your desktop PC, <laughs> oh right? God. And it was connected to your corporate network. <laughs> so your, your savvy user would insert a modem and plug it into the phone line, and you'd have a dual home PC, and he would dial in from home. But then your attacker who's war dialing would also dial in 
from remote. This is the same thing. Except it's the same have, problem. Well, you have to be in physical proximity to get this Bluetooth. Yeah, and what's the, the range of Bluetooth right now is, I think, a, mi a mile with a specialized you, Bluetooth receiver. Yeah, yeah, you're not getting beyond a mile, I don't So think. you could sit at the building across the street and, you know, have your big, massive antenna. Right. Um, that's what she said. Um, <laughs> Which speaks to Paul's other story that is entitled, The Perimeter is Shattered, right? The there is no perimeter anymore. <laughs> you got another story, Paul? This show is uh, shattered. About the perimeter <laughs> being shattered, yes. Believe it or not, we're still... This we're one still again. talking about the perimeter? We're still talking about there the perimeter. There is no more perimeter. It doesn't exist. The perimeter it doesn't exist. dissolved in 2010. Like, At least. As soon as BYOD came out, which should not longer be a term because everything is BYOD. We, and cloud. Can I, and can cloud, I just cloud, say cloud every, be around either. everybody at Jericho Forum should be jumping up and down screaming, I told you so, I told you so, I told you so, in their cute little British accents. <laughs> I can't talk anymore. <laughs> Paul, you got to close I'm the show. I ranted out. Like, I've got all my rant is gone. Oh, uh, we can find something. Sure we could find yeah. some more. Because they <laughs> say. 60 minutes sucked. Yeah, all right. They did a poll. <laughs> and 80% of respondents <laughs> today are looking for the cause of death of the perimeter be beyond simply the confluence of mobility wait, and cloud. Wait, they're looking for the cause of death of the perimeter? Right. Rather why? than fixing the problem. It's just, there is no perimeter. Who cares why it died? It's dead. It's gone. It's buried. <laughs> Move on. Fix your network. Just what realize network? there's no end it, to your network. Well, it, it died because it's not your network anymore, right? Exactly. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's a consumerization. It died because computing is in the hands of everybody on every device it I mean, died there, there is because there's people in the fitness area in your in your corporation wearing a fitbit <laughs> yeah that's why yeah, it died just... <laughs> wait till the apple watches come out oh my god the world as we know it will be over it's like that old argument about network address translation right i mean geez all right it's 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 long gone it's long dead it's it's all oh Okay, this is so depressing. Somebody like put a bullet in this show before I do. What? This is an awesome show. I want to be here every week. <laughs> we, yeah. oh, hey, yeah. you're in. Right. <laughs> Conscript hey, that man. That means I can just sit here and drink and have a cigar. <laughs> Beautiful. You don't have to do any work. <laughs> just feed me stories. I'll rant and we'll be done. Uh, there you go. That's what we do with Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Now you get two for the price <laughs> of one. Two for the price of it's one. It's a twofer. Somebody take, somebody <laughs> oh, look, and people glass. are waving empty glasses at me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right, my goal next week really is to like make people need to curl up on the floor because they won't drive home. Okay, oh, where's and the perimeter it, no, The perimeter it, has moved to the device. It the, wouldn't the be a show, but it wouldn't be a show if I didn't talk about a new WordPress vulnerability. WordPress! <laughs> <All right. laughs> Is it oh in a plugin? God. Please let it be in a plugin. I want it to be in a plugin. In the WordPress plugin in WP Yes, it's Password, a plugin! WP Password Policy Manager plugin. Oh, dear God. At least it's <laughs> nothing important. <sighs> Are we back to password manager? No. What the no, we are not. We're on we WordPress, Jack. Yeah, focus baby. on WordPress. There is plenty to focus on on WordPress that is horribly insecure. You're let me, telling let me, me let to me focus. Say, back in the day. Oh, here we in, go. In uh, 2010. You were in this green van at the NSA park. No, wait. That's no. another story for another night. No, that's this way is, before 2010. This is, this is <laughs> Hacker News did it. We did a big long rant on WordPress plugins. So I'm just saying this is not a news story. But go ahead, Paul. Oh, I don't know. I the, My only point was uh, every week I can find a new WordPress vulnerability oh, yeah. to include in the show notes. Uh, uh, so it's, it's really know that was actually thing, but just it's a another security Band-Aid with a vulnerability on a broken system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In any case. Um, Space yeah. Room, you're going to have to come back and, and talk about Loft. We've had this conversation <sighs> yes. privately. And next it's, week, it was a good next conversation. Week, it was a good conversation. I was quite lit at the time. Can we that fit was in my goal. Let me just Paul. say Stevie Ray's in Louisville Rocks. Ah, oh, Stevie Ray's. That was a good time. It was a good time. Yeah, I would love to come back. Unfortunately, you're about a six-hour drive away. That's not too far. That's not too bad. Maybe we can get, talk to the boss and get him to come back next trips. Friday. I would love to yeah, come back next dude. week. I don't know if that's going to be possible. We need we'll to see. have the, the loft conversation. Yes. Yes. We need to we get you really drunk and talk – uh, I don't want to get you in trouble. Not really we drunk, don't want it moderately. Get Jack to make one another one of these, whatever these were. God. God. Yeah, these are really good. That was that was just a creative Manhattan, you know, a blend of a blend of uh, vermouths and. Uh, so you guys gonna take us into break because it's not my show anymore. So, after this short break, 
we will come back and we'll let the children close out the show for the evening. So uh, thank you for joining us. I've been your host, Space Rogue, and you've been listening to the Hacker News Network. <laughs> Don't forget, send us your selfie of yourself. I know that's redundant, but send us a selfie of you listening to the show and like that, and then we'll send you, we'll pick a winner, and we've already gotten some submissions during the show, and we'll pick a winner and we'll send you a free Hack Naked or Smoke Naked t-shirt. Send it to PSW at securityweekly.com. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Tune in next week on Friday, December 19th, securityweekly.com slash watch. Watch us from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Time or 5 p.m. Eastern Time, roughly. We're going to be drunk, so whatever. Just come watch. It's for a good cause. We're supporting the EFF. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Space Rogue. Thanks, to Joff, for doing the show for me. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks for watching the Hacker News Network. <laughs> See everyone next week. Shades. Somebody gonna say it? Have the shades. Somebody gonna say it? Jack. Okay. Say, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. All right, Joff. Oh, Joff. Joff's, Joff's turn. Do it now. Are you ready? Go to Joff. Over and out. <laughs>